Hello, in this video we're going to take a tour of the major biomes of the world from the poles moving toward the equator. What is a biome? A biome is a large ecological unit recognized by its dominant plant type and other factors relating to temperature and rainfall. So we're especially looking at the average yearly temperature and the rainfall. Those are the two key factors. Here's a map of the major biomes of the world. Notice how in the, e, in the polar regions here, we have tundra. As we move closer toward the equator, we get into an area we call the boreal forest, also called taiga. And as we move into, in this case, the US, we see there are uh, a few major biomes. In the central plains, we have what are called the temperate grasslands. On the eastern seaboard, we have the temperate deciduous forest. In the northwest here, we have the temperate rainforest. We have um, some chaparral area, which is where we live here in Santa Barbara. We have a desert area along here. And we have some minor biomes in here, like uh, these mountainous regions in the Rockies. It all starts with the ways that temperature and rainfall shape the daily weather and feel of a biome. Here's a really good map, or a really good diagram to take a look at. We have two axes. This one is temperature, and on the right, precipitation. So let's take an area that is hot and wet. That would be a tropical rainforest. On the other end of the spectrum would be cold and dry. This is what you have at the poles. So this is the tundra area. And the other end of the extreme here, we have um, hot and dry, desert. And then over here we would have cold and wet, which we don't really find on our planet. In the middle, which is sort of a happy medium, not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, not too dry. We have the temperate deciduous forest. And in this area, we have trees that lose their leaves in the wintertime when it's cold. And we have a fair amount of biodiversity. Here where we live in Santa Barbara, we got chaparral. So that it's mostly hot, but we do have, um, uh, but it's kind of a mix because we can get into some colder areas. We can also get into some precipitation like we have during the rain season. This map is a great map for showing world temperature. And it clearly shows that as you get closer to the equator, it gets warmer. The coldest areas on this map are the poles, the warmest along the equator. Let's take a look at this map showing world precipitation. It also clearly shows that along the equator is where we have the wettest weather. This is where we have our tropical rainforests. And adjacent to them, so just below. So above and below the area along the equator where we have the uh, rainforest, we have the desert areas. And we'll see that on another map as well in class. Let's start with, uh, so generally we have localized climate which creates selective pressures, which create regionally specific adaptations in wildlife and physical characteristics that matter to humans. So for an area um, that might get a lot of rain, we're going to find a lot of vegetation that, um, that thrives under that condition. But the selective pressure would be not favoring plant species that are more um, drought resistant or which actually prefer less water. Or another example with, say, an amphibian that likes a moist area, we're not going to find them in dry desert areas because uh, selectively, the pressure of not having enough water will mean that they don't thrive there. When we say physical characteristics that matter to humans, one example would be lumber, forest areas that provide that as a resource. Let's take a look at tundra. Here's where it would look like if you were at the poles along here, um, farthest from the equator. And some characteristics, it's cold, it's dry. Vegetation is very low and sparse. There are no trees. It's low biodiversity, so not a large number of different species. You do have high summer productivity, meaning lots of plant growth, because in the summer you do have a lot of sun. And the species often hibernate or go, or go dormant in the wintertime, or some species show up just for the good times. They migrate coming in from other places. And this is the Arctic regions. Let's take a look at this diagram here. And it's showing four different locations of the planet as it's orbiting around the sun. The polar regions are circled in red. And we can see that at noon on December 21st, 
the entire polar area is in the shadow of the uh, of the Earth. So it's on the dark side of the Earth. And this is the time when you have um, weeks or months of not seeing the sun, where you might see some faint glow right along the horizon, but never actually see direct sunlight. But if you go 183 days later, so six months, half a year later, now the Arctic Circle is um, perpetually receiving sunshine. The sun is very low in the sky, but, um, but it is present, so it never really gets very dark. Very unusual um, patterns. So we can see here a low-lying sun. When we do have sun, we get lots of plant growth. These are just some pictures to illustrate the tundra region. Human impacts on tundra. One is climate change. With the warming of the planet, we are seeing melting glaciers happening. We have habitat fragmentation happening. Also, as we um, as we mine some of the areas of the tundra regions for their resources like oil and gas. But still roughly 99.3% is classified as intact. Let's take a look at the boreal forests. So now we're starting to get large trees. This is just a little bit closer toward the equator. And temperature is cold but not as bad as the Arctic. Precipitation is low to moderate, so we're getting now more precipitation. We're seeing a lot of evergreen trees. They're fa fast-growing softwood monotypic forest, meaning we might have a, a forest that contains mostly one type of tree, as we can see illustrated in this picture here. Still low biodiversity uh, and still high summer productivity, meaning things grow fast in the summer. And this is in the subarctic regions. Here's some photos. Human impacts on boreal forests. First is logging, logging, and more logging. These are nice trees for lumber. It's roughly 81% is still classified as intact, as these are in areas that are more remote, further from the equator, closer toward the poles. As we move closer toward the equator, we get into the temperate deciduous forests, like where I grew up in Akron, Ohio. So this would be the area along the eastern seaboard. Here, temperature is moderate. It varies with the season. Uh, where I grew up, we had very hot summers, hot and muggy. It could be 90 degrees, 100 degrees. In the wintertime, it would often get to single-digit temperatures. Precipitation occurs throughout the year. Trees are deciduous, meaning they lose their leaves in the fall and are dormant in winter. And there's a moderate diversity of broad-leaved hardwood trees. So you have your oak trees, your maple trees, poplar, Lots of good trees for lumber. And this is seen in North America, Europe, and China. Here's some pictures. Human impacts. Biggest one is habitat fragmentation from human development. As little as 6% remain intact, and in humans inhabit about 82% of this habitat worldwide. Thinking about the eastern part of our country is very densely populated, as is Europe. Let's move on to temperature, temperate rainforest, moving toward the Pacific Northwest. So now we're in this region. Temperature is moderate. Precipitation is very high. Trees grow tall, lots of softwoods and ferns. Dark, moist forest interior. So a bit of a competition here for light. And we find this in the Pacific Northwest region of North America and in Japan. Some pictures. Human impacts, definitely logging. 33% maybe remain intact, though some estimates are as low as 3%. Humans inhabit about 46% of this habitat worldwide. Finally, for, to, for this video, we'll take a look at temperate grassland. Now we're moving into the Great Plains. Some features. Temper temperature is moderate, and it varies with the season. Again, very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. Precipitation is sparse, but stable. So, in other words, it doesn't get a lot of precipitation, but uh, it happens throughout the year, as we can see from this graph here. Fairly steady blue. 
It doesn't dip like other biomes. Grasses dominate. This is a key feature. There are very few trees, and there's a seasonal cycle of grasses growing, dying, and decaying, and this makes for the best soils. As the grasses decay, those nutrients are returned to the soil, and these grasses also have to have good roots because the fact that precipitation is sparse, so even the decay of the roots is also enriching the soil. We get large grazing mammals, like the buffalo you see here. And we find this in North America, Asia, and South America. Here are some pictures. We find um, a pretty wide range of fauna, animals. And here is a striking picture of buffalo skulls and showing just how the buffaloes were in our history. Human impacts. This is farm land supreme, the best soils. Unfortunately, as little as 27.6% remain intact. Humans inhabit about 40%. This area is the breadbasket of America, of America, as we say. So these are soils that we need to do our best to maintain the fertility of. In the next video, we'll take a look at chaparral, moving um, toward the... Um, southwest coast.